Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we have all of the Selenium panel here. You will have Anand moderating this session. And here you go. Mar Anand, please go ahead. Thanks, Subhash. Hi, everyone. Uh, how's the day going? I wish I could hear the response from everyone. No, good, bad. Usually it is good, but uh, I hope it's the same in online. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Diego. Uh, it's uh, it's a great honor to be back again uh, to speak with the Selenium committers. Of course, the list is growing. We could not get everyone. Uh, but thank you, uh, everyone, for being here. And uh, let's get started. We've got a very short time. So I have a question which I would like to go around uh, and have everyone answer uh, that one. I'll answer that myself as well, and uh, then I'll hand it over to you. So the question is, who or what inspires you in your work on Selenium and on other open source projects as well? Okay. To me, this panel, the screen that I'm looking at, is one of my inspirations of being selfless and continuing to contribute and helping uh, build projects uh, that others can use. That is, you guys, you all are an inspiration to me. But what inspires each of you to keep going along with your day job, contribute to Selenium and other open source projects as well? So, uh, Pallavi, if we could start with you. Hey, Anand. First of all, thank you. That was uh, so nice of you saying this. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, That's my first time being here. Uh, what inspires me, and it's great that you started with me. Uh, I'll get over it quickly and then I will just hear everyone talk. So what inspired me to contribute to Selenium was when I was, uh, you know, uh, learning about Selenium and I was uh, writing my books and coaching people. A lot of material which I needed, I used to find uh, across scattered. And I used to be like that the main website of Selenium uh, do not have those examples. So I thought that I would start doing that. I would start adding those uh, code, those documentation, and I wanted it to look nice and good. So that inspired me to uh, start contributing to Selenium. That's awesome. my answer. Awesome. Nothing better than find a problem to fix and then go ahead and fix it, right? Uh, yeah. I think I've always heard Simon say that when I was trying to get into contributing to open source, find a problem that you would like to fix and start doing that, right? So yeah, uh, great, right. great to hear that, Pallavi. Uh, David? Wait, was that me? Yes, please. OK. Uh, so mine is very different, kind of. Um, I. I've always kind of had this weird belief that the internet is the most amazing thing that humanity's ever created, right? And uh, and kind of the browsers and things like that. And so I've always wanted to do something in that space. And then I fortunately came across the uh, like uh, JS testing tools um, back before Selenium and kind of worked on those. And then I kind of started working on Selenium at the time. And it just sees, like I see it as my way of kind of always contributing back to making the internet a slightly better place for everyone every day. And that's why I kind of still stay here. Um, and then kind of meeting all the amazing people that have kind of come along on the journey that I've met uh, along. They just kind of also keep me here every single day. So Awesome. Thank you. Sri Asha? Yeah, um, that's a long story, but I just want to keep it short. <laughs> so in the year of 2018 Selenium conference, um, I saw Manoj on the stage in the committers panel and I got inspired <laughs> by seeing Manoj and his presentation. I decided in that conference to be a Selenium committer and also attended the uh, workshop Fix It Becoming Becoming Committer by Simon Stewart. And uh, it took six months to land my changes, but like, you know, once for the first PR that got accepted and that boosted me up and like, you know, I, in, uh, I was consistently contributing to the uh, Selenium project. So in other hand, uh, I use Selenium on a daily basis, like, you know, for my testing projects. Uh, so uh, contributing to Selenium also helps me to understand how it works and like, you know, what are the new features and what's the, like, you know, uh, how to resolve the bugs and how to use effectively. Yeah. Nice, thanks. Uh, pass it forward, right? Uh, that's what Manoj did for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Manoj, who, uh, who do you look up to in that sense? 
Sure, I think um, my journey was basically started by the saying of uh, scratch your own niche. Um, and then was consulting for a client. I had to look up, you know, doing a proof of concept for Selenium and I uh, had to look up for some solutions and it was not there. So that's when I ended up uh, in the IRC channel, having a chat with uh, wonderful people, so uh, meeting Simon uh, and, you know, other wonderful folks who helped me, you know, get started with the journey. And uh, I think from a contribution per se and from an inspiration perspective, a couple of names that helped me in the project that came all the way along was definitely Simon Stewart and uh, Santi, Santiago. He was an ex Labs. He's a wonderful person. Um, and uh, so the originals, I don't know how many of you have seen the Selenium HQ or ORG, which is now different now, but uh, it used to be the documentation. I started using true documentations and um, it was in the RST format. So it was an over-engineering for me back then, uh, how figuring out how the RST format works and how it. So and then on, it went up to, and um, of course, Simon has been my mentor all, all these days. Uh, so I look up to him. Uh, despite his uh, struggles in the recent days uh, from health-wise. And my recent inspiration has been none other than Pooja in front of us. Like, uh, I, I remember that uh, she was actually going on a maternity leave. And um, when uh, we were preparing for a Selenium Grid workshop, I had to disturb her, you know, and she was all available uh, to help us on the observability, uh, you know, issues that some of the things that we had to, you know, handle. And uh, so thanks, Pooja, for that. It's using this platform to thank you. Uh, but the list goes on, right? So, uh, of course, all of these people in the panel, in a way, has been inspiration, starting from David to Diego and Pallavi, too. Thank you. Pooja, I guess Manoj handed the baton to you. Thanks, Manoj. It's been actually wonderful collaborating with you um, in the past. So, for me, it's been a little different. I It was just, I took a job at Browser Stack. Uh, Coincidentally, I was a part of the open source team and I was told to work on Selenium. I honestly had no idea what it was. I had no idea what open source involvement everything was like, but I remember how warm the entire team was and how welcoming they are. And I also constantly see, I think Selenium is a magnet. So even if they go on a leave, on a vacation, on a sabbatical, I always see someone coming back and they have that warmth all over again. And that constantly inspires me. And I've seen everyone take up different roles in different times. If there's a testing time, if there's time to help someone, or even when the project needs help, I've seen everyone jump in and push everything aside and come forward. And it's very inspiring to see each one of them do that in a very different manner. Nice. And now that you are in the open source <laughs> community, is there, hopefully there is no checkout, right? Now no, I love it. There is no checkout. <laughs> No, I'm not checking out. I love it. <laughs> she said it. She checks in even if she's off. So checking is al always there. Awesome. Awesome. Diego. Um, yeah, for me, it has been mostly the people because in general, you could say that code is code and, and it could be, uh, you could find nice code bases everywhere. But uh, yeah, when I got near the project in my first conference in 2017, um. Manush was very welcoming. Simon was very really welcoming. I was a bit of uh, nervous of like giving my first talk, and and they were very comforting. Simon outside the the, the room, and then Manush was uh, giving this introduction. So that was the first bit that I could like taste from the project, where uh, in general people are very friendly. And then you go to any meetup, to any conference, to any type of encounter, and and people are just open, and and they just want to collaborate and 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 work together. And so that motivates me to continue with the project because I feel it's some sort of like a like a good group of friends that you don't want to let down. Also, the community, you want to provide a solution that they can use for many, many years. Uh, so it's also a bit of fairness, right? Like giving something to people that can they can rely on and they don't have to change their code like every single time there is a new release. So also like a bit of, you know, being fair to people, they have to invest time, they have to work on it. And so giving them a platform where they can just achieve their goals. So yeah, it's people and I guess a bit of fairness in the in what we have as as, as the world. Yeah. Awesome. And the kind of impact uh, everyone has created for the community. And we speak of community in that sense quite loosely, right? It's not just people who are coming together for fun or to learn. It's actually livelihoods and businesses run on top of the great work that everyone has been doing. 
So thank you again, everyone uh, who are on this call right now, this session right now, and those who could not join. So special thanks to everyone to make that happen. But uh, uh, Diego, you mentioned something very interesting uh, in the State of the Union, and that was related to the stats, the way we've started capturing them. And I was very surprised with uh, looking at that data as well, about which language, for example, is more popular than the other, is being used more often than not uh, for Selenium, and Python was on top of the charts, right? And now that kind of data, how is it helping the committee, PLC, TLC take decisions? Does it change anything in terms of prioritization, what we should do more or less or first or later? Um, yeah, the first thing I would say is that we have to take those numbers with, with a lot of care because uh, we're just starting to we have seen, you know, website traffic, like downloads. We are like having over 100 million download, downloads in Java. Uh, Python is doing extremely well. But one thing is actually downloading the tool. Other things actually using it on a daily basis. So we're understanding better what this means to us. Uh, we're now perceiving better how often, how, how quickly people move to new versions. Um, and right now, yeah, in the last four or five versions, is Python the most used language? But who knows what is happening between Selenium 4 and 4.16. Many people are still in Selenium 3. Um, so it's just the beginning to understand what it means, this, this universe of data. So I would say that it's we're, we're using it to understand better um, what platforms are more, most more used, uh, where we should put more effort. Maybe we should like find ways to test more often on Windows machines or things like that. But mm. it's still way too early to say, OK, this is pointing us that this is what we should do because it's just six months of data and we are like have been here for 20 years. So it's, it's really hard to say. Okay. No, no that's fair. Not any metric should be used with caution anyway, right? So uh, that that makes sense. Uh, thanks for sharing. I mean, what is, to, to be honest, the, I think that the main thing that has, so this set of numbers is giving us is like, oh, wow, like Selenium is used a lot, way more than we actually thought. Uh, because you see online that people say Selenium is dying and this, that, and that. But if we had a department of marketing, this would be different. But uh, anyway, um, we're seeing that Selenium is extremely used uh, across the world. Yeah. Yep, definitely it is. Yeah. Uh, I've any place I go to, it's probably nineteen out of twenty, or forty-eight, forty-nine out of fifty times would be Selenium is used you know, compared to any other tool. Uh, that is there. Uh, so now uh, that's great. The next big thing, as I understand, in Selenium 5, which we are already getting up, uh, and this is probably something that Pooja mentioned again in the State of the Union, is by die, right? Uh, how it's already there and there's a lot of work happening on it. My you know, question over here is how is this really going to change test automation as a practice, as tool sets, frameworks? as a skill set as well. What does that really mean? I'll take a stab at this one. Yeah. Just, so for the most part, I don't think a lot of people need to care about it in the, the greater sense, in that a lot of things are just going to carry on working as they are. What it mostly does is it opens up new avenues to kind of test things that we've never been able to test before or kind of have just been slightly more complex so things like webdriver io and nightwatch.js they can kind of update their auto weighting to use bydi instead of kind of the polling that they have been doing in the, the past um which allows kind of better um like more nuanced ways of kind of waiting for things to happen uh, and hopefully will help with kind of some of the flakiness that kind of creeps in over time um and so it, it's it's just it's it's a kind of it's kind of like selenium manager it's one of the greatest features in selenium that you can forget ever exists uh bido is going to be the same way but it means that um like tools like puppeteer can can become an opinionated web driver uh instead of having to rewrite everything themselves right and so we we're, we're heading down that road where we can kind of get new features that other frameworks have been doing for a while and do amazing things. Nice. Uh, anything else to add 
from others? I think um, from a user perspective, being a consultant, um, I think for some specific reasons, you know, as people moved to DevTools based uh, frameworks, not mentioning the names here, but, uh, you know, imagine those features are coming back to Selenium. Right? So then probably in the future, you might see, you know, users coming back to Selenium as well. So it gives you the flexibility of having that interoperability, uh, you know, having an external system driving the browser, as well as having the internal mechanism to talk to DevTools and bring in those, you know, any features of Baidai that, uh, you know, Puja was showcasing in the talk, uh, you know, having the flexibility of both will actually bring in a greater uh, test automation experience for the test suites. Um, so I'm very excited uh, to have all these projects implement those by now. Yeah, I want to add to that. Um, so I think uh, the famous statement that goes is Selenium automates browsers and that's it. What you do with that part is up to you. So now there are more things, more power to the people. So what we mentioned in State of the Union, what Diego helped us walk through is about the whole web driver and even web driver by the ecosystem. Uh, there can be other tools. So Selenium will provide these APIs and they can go there and be very creative and write their own wrappers. And those eventually will help make developers or testers life easier. So there's just more tools, more APIs for out there for anyone to be creative. People do all sorts of fun things with Selenium, right? Web scraping, playing a game. I think David showed me a video, someone is uh, playing a game using Selenium. So they can do all sorts of fun things. So it just opens up a lot of uh, creative space in that sense as to what they can do with it and what use case do they want to solve with it. So it's just more opp opportunity in that side of things. Absolutely. And another classic example is fill the timesheet, right? That's how it all started. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, great, Mariah. So I understand um, there's a lot more opportunities, a lot more interesting use cases that you can think of. And of course, make your automation more efficient as well uh, with the SPIDA implementation. But how does AI play a role in all of this? Does it even impact it or not? I don't think so because um, the direction we're taking with the project since a couple of years is to provide a base library for people to implement their AI features. So AI still needs some primitives to interact with the browser. And this is the Selenium project. So if you want some sort of AI tool, if you're building one or if you want to use one, and they rely on a tool that is built on top of standards. So if you want your AI tool to work well in Safari and in Chrome and in all of that, well, then you should use something like uh, the web driver standard now by that in the future, near future. Um, so AI will be uh, getting profit out of all these implementations because the primitives to control browsers will be more, uh, will be richer. And then uh, it will be just uh, I guess you will be able to use a more solid AI tool because it's based on on a tool that has standards uh, under the hood. But, I mean, that's my opinion, but I guess there are different opinions around here. So uh, in my experience, I've used AI for testing uh, as a test engineer, but I see the problem with AI is it has been trained with limited set of data. So if I ask for the BIDI code in Selenium, it cannot like you know uh, give the suggestions right so uh, it is like you no know, far way uh, old i can say ai it has to be trained but like you know uh, if we keep on updating ourselves into the new technologies and new releases or the change log uh, like uh, ai cannot replace yeah okay so gen ai has no impact or rather should not impact what the selenium project is doing what it is uh, providing to the community, to the users. The tools that use uh, Selenium in the backbone, they might be able to use Gen AI to make things easier. Is that what I'm understanding then? Definitely. Yeah, I think, I think AI will only help you augment whatever creative use cases that you want to come up with, right? Say, for example, I've been fiddling around with the uh, large language models, right? So you could you'll still need, I think probably that's one of the reasons why Python has a lot of more downloads in recent days, uh, because the AI space is completely in Python. So you have a Python code, like take a screenshot, 
you know, you know, put that screenshot into multimodal vision, you know, based languages and you ask for feedback. So it gives you feedback. So that's a use case for classic AI, right? So using large language models within your Selenium script. And there are multiple cases like that. And I've seen a lot of companies have started uh, based out of it. Like there could be uh, creative use cases. There could be company coming out of it. So definitely AI will augment. AI and, you know, all the language models will augment the automation, you know, be it uh, whatever APIs we're going to use. So it's not impact Selenium as a tool as such, but Selenium, as Diego mentioned, it's the core library. So using that, along with the AI capabilities, multimodal vision capabilities, you could come along with whatever, you know, more power to you. That's it. Okay. Uh, David, sorry, you were saying something. I was saying exactly the same as kind of what Manoj was going to say. It's there's you can only do so much with what it knows, and what Sri mm -hmm. was also saying. Like, um, I kind of think at the moment where AI is is that there's a lot of hype and a lot, a lot to back that hype. Um, I do believe in the future it's going to do amazing things. I'm not sure everything's just there just yet. Okay. Oh, that's but good. More. One last thing. I mean, we, we're we're actually using AI in the Selenium project. I mean, many of us have like Copilot. It helps us to like deliver code faster. Uh, we have a plugin uh, in our um, repository that reviews PRs, for example, and then it's helping us to you know if you want to contribute, it's gonna give you feedback right away. So it's not embedded in Selenium, but we're using. We're not saying that AI is not the thing, but. We're just using it as well to deliver code faster uh, as much as we can as well. So Selenium is a tool in, that you use in your development process. Uh, AI is also a tool in the development process. So it's a complement, not really something. That Diego has better. AI. He read my mind. That was my next yeah. question. Is the Selenium project using AI in any way? And you already answered that. <laughs> so, I was about to but, add that when we, when we make a contribution, we get the AI talking back to us. You can improve your code by doing this, this, this. I yeah. think Titus Titus added that bot mm -hmm. to the documentation. It sends quite interesting reviews, but it's up to us to accept them or just move on. Exactly. Yeah. Nice. I'm going to switch to some of the questions that have been asked by participants, uh, attendees. Uh, so the first one is, how can any uh, how anyone can contribute to Selenium when we have lot to contribute in the office as well. So how do you manage both those things? Uh, I'll take a stab at this since I kind of run an, an open source program office okay. is that um, th there's a beautiful XKCD where it shows kind of frameworks and there's this one little framework in the bottom right uh, and it's managed by a person in Nebraska. And if it ever fell apart, everything else would fall apart. Um, and so you need to speak to kind of your leadership and go, hey, if we're not contributing to this and everyone stops, how is this going to impact our business, right? There is a return on investment when it comes to these things. Um, it's why like Browser Stack does it, it's why Source Labs does it, it's why Lambda Test does it, but like, you know, all these companies do it. Um, and it, there's a certain amount of keeping the thing that keeps you alive, alive, right? Uh, yeah. And so if you're not doing it, that is the kind of the, the main reason why you should be doing this. Yeah. Uh, that's a great way of looking at it and trying to convince someone. But there wouldn't be as many such problems or severe case uh, examples like what you shared, right, David? There would be you, you'd be you'd be surprised, right? Like so, uh, my my favorite example in this case is everyone in the world relies on Open SSL to kind of keep their VPNs, their browsers, everything secure. Mm -hmm. Less than two three years ago, uh, it was kind of managed by like three four people, and there were huge problems which impacted literally the entire planet, right? And yeah. so you need to take into account, like, what is that risk? The same with the log4j, if you're a JavaScript, a Java person, right? Like, that was a huge, impacted banks, governments, things like that. And that was just a logging framework, right? Like, uh, the, it might seem like a small thing here, but mm. you never know how how much impact it is. And like Diego said in the uh, State of the Union, and he said today, is that, like, we're, Selenium's being used way more than we thought. And we didn't realize it. Hmm. 
makes sense. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Sri? I think I think uh, Harsha. I want to hear Harsha's opinion because yeah. uh, I think yeah, I think some some of of us here have you know um, some sort of role with the project. Uh, but Harsha, being a full time consultant, working on you know forty hours per week on on entirely different. I want to see how he you know uh, allocates the time to Selenium and tries to spend on it. Go ahead, Harsha. <laughs> yes, Manoj. So yeah, paid work takes a lot more lot of my time. I only spend uh, like, you know, a couple of hours in a day for sure for the open source. So I find like, you know, I uh, plan my work time and um, my time schedule accordingly. And uh, sometimes it may not be possible, but if you are consistent and if you have like, you know, uh, eager to contribute to the open source, you can spend some 30 minutes to two hours in a day. That should be more enough to get started with the contribution. Yeah. Well, you work 40 hours a week and you still find time a couple of hours a day. So that, that is motivation, actually, right? Inspirational and it is motivation. Uh, but I hope that uh, helps uh, the person and others who might have the similar question as well. Uh, you, you need to find that problem which is going to be, which could become critical for you. You need to find that inspiration, that motivation factor that will tell you, okay, I need to do something. And it could be something small. It could end up being something big as well. Uh, so moving on, we just have a few minutes remaining, but, and the other question we have is any news for Safari compatibility? So Apple do support the kind of the W3C work that is happening at the moment. Um, Apple unfortunately have a, an amazing phrase of, uh, Apple do not uh, discuss future releases. So if you ever ask them where things are, when they're coming, you will always get Apple does not uh, talk about future releases. It's there. Um, like we know that like WebDriver uh, can, or Selenium can work against like iOS devices. Like uh, it can work against um, things like that. So it is there. Um, I wish Apple were a bit more forthcoming in what they're doing compared to like uh, Google and Mozilla. But hopefully in the future they will. Great. Uh, that helps. Uh, the so I'll have two more questions. I guess that's the only time we have. Uh, the other question is, is there any development for web automation of Flutter projects as it loads everything in a single canvas-based element? Okay. Oh, sorry, I'm going to jump no. in. Yes, it's no one else is jumping in. Uh, is um, when we see things like this, I truly believe this is a failure of that framework, right? In the same sense of like React Native, doing any Appium on React Native is painful, right? Uh, and you have to break kind of how you would go about generally break, uh, creating an application uh, to use Appium. Um, so like testing is never thought about, right? These are great examples of testing never being thought about by the frameworks that are in there. Um, I personally would push against Flutter uh, to kind of solve that problem. Um, and they can always do this. At worst, um, there's the user interactions API. It's designed for situations where you have a, a canvas and you need to do it. Um, but that will create flaky tests um, because you can't actually see things as they are. And if you move things about, you have no way of doing that. Uh, so, um, but I'm also happy if whoever wrote that, if you want to message me on the Selenium mm -hmm. Slack, um, I will go um, fight with you on this one to make sure but that Flutter gets it better. Ah, Flutter. Okay, I didn't get the because um, actually that was gonna be my counter example to React Native because I so Flutter actually has testing thought in it. They have a framework to test Flutter applications. Uh, well, not in Appium. Appium is being developed these days, um, but you can do web testing with the Flutter tool that they provide. And if you check the repository under the hood, they're using WebDriver. Um, mm -hmm. So you can do. You have to write it in Dart. That's the issue, uh, but they have thought about that. And there are some ways that you can, um, because everything inside the Flutter application is in, a, is in a Shadow DOM. So there are ways that you can like open that and then use normal web drivers. So I guess, yeah, come to the to the Selenium Slack or IRC. And, and, and I have tried that because a customer was asking us uh, how to do that. But yeah, I, that was my counter example. Flutter does have a, a way of doing testing and under who uses web driver. Okay. 
Great. Uh, thanks. Uh, we are actually out of time. 